You boys be quiet down there! Welcome back to PC-98 Paradise, the series where we take a close look at classic games for the NEC PC-98, the most popular Japanese PC series of the early 1990s. Moving right along in our coverage of the Far Land Story games, this time we're doing the third game in the series, Far Land Story Tenshi no Namida, which means Angel's Tears. I'm especially excited about this one since it's the first game in the series I've never played at all, though I've had it sitting in my collection for 20 years. This is the first one where they changed over to who I would call the main character designer of the Far Land series, Kazue Yamamoto. She was credited as one of the graphic artists in the second game, and for the third I guess she was promoted. Her style is almost unmistakable when you look at the new character here in the background. Yamamoto apparently began her career helping out with character design at Capcom, though I can't find any information about what games she might have worked on there. While she isn't credited on any of TGL's adult games, she later became known for her work in the adult games and illustration industry. And today she actually has her own adult game company. According to Wikipedia, as of 2001 she was recognized as having drawn the most original adult game illustrations of any artist. Holy crap! Well, good for her, I guess. If you're a fan of that sort of thing, go check her out after the video if you want. Farland Story, the family-friendly series with character designs from a hentai artist. Wow, I learned more about this series than I bargained for today. Let's just open that game I bought 20 years ago and see if there are any spiders inside. Once again, there's a poster with the same illustration as the cover of the game. And here's the manual. Looks like they switched back to black and white. What's this? It seems to be a newsletter and advertisement for TGL's fan club. Here's a questionnaire and registration card. And here's a form to sign up for that fan club mentioned earlier. Once again, there's a soundtrack CD. Although it says original soundtrack, it isn't the FM sound version, but rather an arranged version. In general, I found the arrangements on this one to be a little less interesting than the CD that came with the last game. And lastly, the floppy disks. This time there are five instead of four. The installer is located on disk B this time, but is basically identical to the previous ones. The one big improvement is that there's no longer a separate application for the opening sequence. You simply start the main application by running fsx.bat in the root directory of the hard drive, and the opening sequence begins automatically every time you start the game. It's very different from the openings of the first two games, this time relying mostly on text rather than animation, in order to greatly expand the lore of the world and take things in a dramatic new direction. For the first time, we learn that the Farland universe is comprised of four different worlds, the Earth, where humans live, the afterlife, where they go after they die, and between those two are the heavens, where the gods watch over humans. And lastly, of course, is the demon world that we visited in the first two games, which exists below the earth. Long before humans were born, a god named Demetor became king of the heavens, and gave birth to the god of bravery, who in turn gave birth to many goddesses. These goddesses sometimes visited the earth, and the places they visited became holy places and shrines. Next, the demons also visited the earth, but the gods fought alongside humans to seal them away in the demon world. Those gods placed their powers inside five stones, four of which were kept at holy places on earth, while the fifth was kept by the sun god, Ra. However, the king of the heavens, Demetor, named himself the king of darkness and transformed himself into a demon. He wanted the magic stones for himself and killed his own descendant, Ra, in order to take her stone. As punishment, Demetor's son, the god of bravery, banished him to the demon world. This is said to be an old legend from the sacred texts of this world. The opening isn't as impressive as the previous ones, but the rest of the game makes up for it by having, I wouldn't call them cutscenes, but lots of still graphics to help tell the story throughout the game. One weird thing is that exiting to DOS from the title screen will leave it printed in the background. This makes it really hard to read text until you clear it. 
Anyway, let's start a new game, and the real story begins. We begin with a young girl named Fauna, who suddenly finds herself awakening in Felsario Castle, ruled by King Ark, the protagonist of the previous games. Ark's queen, Ferio, found Fauna laying near the castle grounds earlier. Ferio takes Fauna to the room next door to talk to Ark, but he's nowhere to be found. Ferio calls out to Ark to ask if he's there, and Ark gives us only silence in response. Oh no, Ark is now some sort of ghostly, disembodied voice who can only communicate with Ferio at certain times. What on earth happened since the last game? Oh, he was just hiding behind the bookcase to get a break from his royal duties. That works too. I mean, I guess they're trying to make this like a movie scene where the viewer gradually figures out what's going on by watching rather than having things over-explained, but I found this part kind of weird and disorienting. Not only is it told primarily from the perspective of an amnesiac, but we don't know how much time has passed since the previous game. Ferio's illustration looks very different, and we have this mysterious sounding music playing in the background. We have no idea what's changed, if anything, since the end of the last game. But just so you know, actually very little has. Anyway, Ferio and Ark decide to take Fauna to see the Archbishop at the shrine nearby. Maybe he can be of some help. And so begins the first stage of the game. Things start out very simple here, with only three characters and small maps. Fauna is a sorceress who attacks with a fire ring, and Ark and Ferio are very much the same as before. At least they are in the beginning, anyway. The class change system from the first game is back, and this time they happen at level 20 or higher, once you find the necessary weapons to change them. This eventually gives us tons of new character animation, and even the enemies are almost all brand new, with very little recycled monster animation from the previous games, and the character portraits are completely new as well. There are almost no changes at all to the game system itself, everything works exactly the same as the second game, save for one subtle difference that you probably won't even notice but I certainly did. The mouse speed is slower. Holy crap, this actually kinda sucks. In the previous two games, I liked how quickly I was able to look around the map and move the characters. I was actually starting to even like this old PC-98 ball mouse, and was impressed by how well this old technology still works. But now this game is bringing back bad memories of using horrible mice back in the 90s. I hate having to constantly pick it up off the mouse pad in order to get the cursor to the other end of the screen. For a while, I tried to live with it. After all, this is how the designers made the game. I should respect their decision and play the game how it was intended, right? I got through about the first third of the game with this mouse, but it continued to bother me a bit. It would be nice if the game had a mouse speed setting, but no such luck. I even tried adjusting the speed with an external mouse driver in DOS, but it didn't seem to have any effect. The game has its own internal mouse driver that overrides everything. This is gonna need a hardware solution. How about buying a different mouse? Some PC-98 mice had what's called a count switch to adjust the speed. Sure, that might help, but with only two or three settings, how do I know before I buy that the speeds aren't just going to be slow and slower? So I looked again at those USB mouse adapters I mentioned in my first Farland Story video. The cheaper one I've been looking for apparently does still get made occasionally, but they can't keep up with demand and it gets sold out immediately whenever there's new stock. Account change function is listed for a possible future firmware update. Then I looked again at that much more expensive adapter at ClassicPC.org, which is not only readily available, it apparently has the count change function working right now. Okay, that clinches it. They got my money again. Now I've got two of their keyboard adapters and one mouse adapter. Additionally, though the photo on their website shows one with the circular DIN plug used mostly in later PC-9821 models, they mention in the description that they can also make ones for the female Atari-type port that my system uses. So that's what I had them do. By the way, even if I had just got the circular one pictured on the site, I could have still used it via a simple adapter that's easily available used. But might as well get one made with the right plug in the first place, right? With the adapter connected, you can adjust the mouse count by pressing in the scroll wheel while turning it. Wow, you can do way too fast, way too slow, or anything in between. I love this. Playing the rest of the game with this adapter was a pleasure. And can we pause for a second to just marvel at how cool it is using an optical mouse on a PC-98 made in 1993? Anyway, thanks ClassicPC.org, and to dispel any ideas that they might be sponsoring me, I'll say it again. Their stuff is pricey. Anyway, let's get back to the game. The party arrives at the shrine where the Archbishop isn't much help. 
Eleanor arrives to report that the castle has been attacked, and immediately one of the main new villains arrives, demanding that they hand over the girl. This guy is simply identified as Demon Army General, and speaks mostly in katakana instead of hiragana, with English words interspersed. What this means is that he's supposed to be speaking Japanese with sort of a foreign English speaker's accent. Yeah. Yep, this character is making fun of gaijin like you and me. The reverse of English speakers trying to imitate Asian stereotypes, and a character trope you'll see occasionally in Japanese games and animation. There were times decades ago I might have been kind of offended, but nowadays I mostly find it funny. So now Eleanor joins the party along with Narciss, a new priest who was introduced at the shrine. He's a healer who also has a decently serviceable attack. The party fights their way out of the shrine and through the castle. When Ark goes to check on the sacred sword from the previous games, he's confronted by Zavel, the end boss of the second game. Though he was destroyed, he says that he's eternal, as long as his master, the god of darkness Demitor, exists. Wow, what a retcon. Zavel destroys the sacred sword, saying that as the key to the demon world, the sword is no longer necessary, and he also easily puts Ark out of commission. Ark awakens, and when he mentions the name Demitor, it rings a bell for Fauna who remembers that name as the God of Darkness. The Archbishop and other characters there also know of him, as well as the legend of the five magic stones from the opening of the game. Apparently the doorway to the demon world has been opened again, and this time the only way to close it is with the five magic stones. So now we have our main goal of the game this time, finding the stones. But finding the first one sends the party on quite a scavenger hunt. First they need to find an old elf named Isaac who might know the whereabouts of the stones. But before he will tell them where they are, he asks them to bring back a legendary sword from a cave. Now this is different, mind you, from the sacred sword that was destroyed earlier. Before they can enter the cave though, they need to go get permission from the mayor of the village nearby. When they get to the village, it's occupied by monsters, and they meet up with the siren Arena from the previous games, who is accompanied by a new playable character, Prim, a mysterious girl who can only speak in simple Japanese baby talk, and has only a simple physical attack. This stage also introduces us to a new type of enemy. These thieves can not only attack, but sometimes they steal the party's money instead. That actually sucks a lot, because you're gonna need that money in this game. This village has a shop you can visit. Whereas in the previous games you would park a character on top of a town in order to shop, here there are also town stages with shops in them, as well as these very out of place retail stands in some of the caves and dungeons. Seems like kind of an odd place to pick up a bottle of whiskey. By the way, I like mine with sparkling water, which is known simply as a highball here in Japan. While I'm enjoying this, let's talk about a few other random things about the game. The treasures hidden on the map are generally less obvious than in previous games. There aren't many flowery patches hiding chests, and lots of places that look like they might have hidden chests have nothing there at all. That sucks, but hey, check out this bloody animation for when you attack the werewolves. That's kinda cool. And here's a part where I was attacked by a fairy with a metal butt. It wasn't very effective. So the party gets to the mayor's house, but he's out searching for herbs for his ailing wife. Damn, when are we going to get to those magic stones? The party has to save the mayor from monsters in the forest nearby, and then he grants access to the cave, where the party finally gets the legendary sword, though Ark can't actually equip it until the very end of the game. They bring the sword back to Isaac, who reveals he doesn't actually know where any of the stones are, but a talking sacred tree does. It's in the forest of the elves, where of course the party is joined by Lucida, the elf from the previous games. The tree tells the party that the sacred sword will be necessary to destroy the guardians of the stones, and that the first stone is located in a cave to the south. When they find the first one, they'll also learn the location of the next one, the tree says. This cave is a great example of how small some of the stages in the game are. Here you just have to walk over to the stone, while a few enemies pop out and ambush you here and there. We also meet up with that English-speaking demon general again, who is easily defeated by the party and runs away. They get the first stone, and a hint to find the next one written in an ancient language. Luckily, Narciss knows how to read it, and learns that the next stone is in a shrine on the other side of an ocean. To get to the port town, the party crosses a desert, where they're joined by two more familiar faces, Dokati and Dino. No, Dino, no, not me! Damn! 
In the port town, they find a ship, and it comes with another new party member, a sailor named Tack. Tack attacks the enemies by whacking them with an oar. The main aspect of his character that will be repeated throughout the game is that he has a bit of a crush on Fauna. On the other side of the ocean, the party asks for directions at a hut, where they're poisoned by an old woman who turns out to be a monster. The poison transforms the characters into monsters, specifically these fox-like creatures. The only one who doesn't seem to be affected by the poison is Prim, who reveals that she's already a monster. She was turned into a slime some time before she met up with the party, and is now able to take any form she chooses. She leads the party to one of the bases of the demon army, where she knows there is sacred water that can restore them to human form. This is a funny stage where your party is a bunch of foxes, plus Prim. Stuff like this really helps to keep the game fresh and interesting. The foxes fight against the demon general guy again, and they obtain the sacred water, which transforms them all back, except for Prim. She explains that she has already been a monster for too long to go back. She now has a useful shape-shifting ability, though. When she's nearby another one of your characters, she can transform into an exact copy of them, with identical stats, equipment, and all. This is useful for parts like the bosses, where you can turn her into a copy of your strongest character for some additional massive attacks. But the fact that she doesn't obtain experience while transformed makes me want to avoid using this ability most of the time. I hate killing enemies without gaining experience. Anyway, we find the next stone with the help of an old scholar who joins the party. I thought it would be kind of fun to try and level up this weak joke of a character and make him sort of usable, but joke's on me, I guess. He leaves the party after a couple stages. On the way to finding the next stone, they meet a summoner named Boja who joins the party. In case you're curious, his summon magic is similar to Lucida's attacks from the previous games. Unfortunately, this is another character I shouldn't have bothered trying to level up, since he is quickly revealed to be a servant of the dark god Demitor, who steals the party's magic stones, kidnaps Fana, and sends the party to the demon world where they find themselves locked in a dungeon. They are then freed by a mysterious character named Asid, who joins the party. Outside the dungeon, they get a good look at the demon world, and are helped by Ark's old rival Diva, who was killed in the first game. They explain later that he was reborn into the heavens since he was a monster who had a change of heart before he died. It's overly complicated, but I guess they just really wanted to bring this character back. He takes the party to heaven where they meet his new master, the current king of the gods, Hermes. Hermes agrees to return the party to the earth if they help him restore the two goddesses who are under the control of the dark god Demeter. The next two stages each require you to obtain an item in a chest called a Pearl of Life and then defeat a goddess so the party can use the pearl to restore her to normal. Hermes returns the party to the earth. After another stage there, Asid reveals his true identity, a servant of the sun god Ra who came from 300 years in the future, and he also reveals that Fauna is the sun god Ra, who was reborn as a human in yet a different age in the future. Demetor and Boja found her by searching through time, but before they could capture her, Asid sent her to Ark's time, which is why they found her outside the castle with Amnesia at the beginning of the game. Anyway, they still need to find the remaining magic stones before the bad guys do, and this sends them on another trip across the ocean. Whoa, pirates? Are you sure that's a good idea? I mean, but we kill pirates. Anyway, in one of the next stages, they defeat that English-speaking demon general for good and get the third stone, but the fourth one is taken by Boja before the party can reach it. They travel next to the Shrine of Ra, where they defeat not only the boss of the second game Zavo again, but also Boja, who is revealed to be Asid's brother, before he finishes himself off. Then the party finds themselves face to face with Fauna and the god of darkness Demetor. He explains that Fauna is not only the sun god reborn, but also Ark and Ferio's granddaughter from 50 years in the future. He plans to have Fauna kill Ferio, and by killing her own bloodline before she is born as Fauna, she will be reborn instead as the sun god. Then Demetor will obtain the sun god's power as well as the five magic stones and use them to send all the humans to the demon world, while he and all demons rule over the earth. Okay, did you follow all that? It's a bit convoluted, but you have to at least give them some points for creativity here. Ferio's body begins moving by itself toward Fauna, and Demetor decides to watch it all happen from the roof of the shrine. Classic villain mistake. 
Fauna begins attacking the party and Fario, but the player has control over Fario now so we can move her out of harm's way. The party easily defeats Fauna and she returns to normal. Fauna's tears are revealed to be the final magic stone. Hermes' voice speaks to Ark and tells him to take back the remaining three stones from Demetor and use them to seal the doorway to the demon world again. The final two stages are a fight to decide who gets to keep all five stones. We fight against both Demetor's humanoid form and then his true form in the final stage. Demetor is destroyed, but his final words are that evil will never die, as it exists in the hearts of all humans. And boy is he right about that, because otherwise they wouldn't have a series, right? A seed returns Fauna and himself to their respective time periods, as Tax says a tearful goodbye from his ship. Oh yeah, and there's this pirate lady here who I didn't mention because she wasn't very important to the overall plot. Ark uses the legendary sword to seal the time portal, as he was instructed by a seed. Well, Doc. It's destroyed. Just like you want it. And we are left with some final words from the sacred texts of this world. Long ago, there was a man who used a legendary sword to save the world from darkness. This is a legend from an ancient world called Farland, and the hero King Ark who lived there. A legend from a faraway world long, long ago. It's a heartfelt goodbye to Ark, who won't be returning as the protagonist again. If you want to experience his last adventure for yourself in English, once again there's an English patch for the game, but this is the first in the series where the translator figured out how to alter the difficulty of the game and decided to try and increase the challenge. I can totally understand why he wanted to do that. This series is known for being extremely easy, but for me that's actually part of the appeal. I like to use these games to just chill out and relax in front of my PC-98, without sweating too much about whether I'll be able to clear a stage or not. Furthermore, reportedly in order to increase the difficulty, he mostly just added additional enemies, which probably just makes the games take longer to play through. No thanks. If you want to play the games in English with a minimal amount of alteration, use the original Japanese.unt files rather than the ones included with the English patch. According to the translator's notes for the fourth game, this should allow you to mostly keep the original difficulty in all of these games. Some of the difficulty settings, though, are unfortunately contained in the executable files, which you'll want to use the patched versions of in order to get English. But don't ask me for any support if you encounter issues. I've hardly even used the patches myself, aside from capturing a little footage on real hardware for these videos. The debug mode from the second game is here again, but this time you can activate it any time during the game by holding down the control, shift, and graph keys while opening and closing the unit list in the menu. When the text appears in the corner, you'll know it's activated. In addition to the warp command from the previous game, this one adds a clear command which allows you to skip immediately to the next stage. With the debug mode activated, you can also max out any character's stats via the same method as the second game. As for the music, I'm afraid it's a bit of a downgrade from the previous game in my opinion. Two new composers to the series, Tatsuya Yoshi and Naoya Shimokawa, are the only ones credited. While the sound is generally pleasant and there are a few catchy tunes, the arrangements demonstrate a bit less mastery over the FM sound chip. There's one particular track that's really just irritating. Hmm, I wonder if this one fares any better in the MIDI and CD arrangements. Nah, it's still not very good. Along with maybe the catchy field BGM, the boss BGM is the only track I really love in this one, especially the breakdown part in the bass line near the end. But anyway, all the same sound options as the last game are here, so let's compare them again.
This game unfortunately does away with the PCM voices that were in the previous one. The only port of this game is the Asian MS-DOS version. This and all the subsequent PC-98 games were never ported to Windows or any consoles. The third Farland Story game is a huge evolution from the previous two. The first had a rather generic RPG plot, and while the second greatly improved the game system, it was still rather short and felt more like a collection of side stories rather than a tale someone really wanted to tell. The third game obviously has a much more original and complex plot, though I do think some may find it to be a bit too much to follow. Additionally, the game has a total of 40 stages, rather than the puny 14 in each of the previous ones. Though many of the 40 stages are rather small, it's still a much longer game as a whole. The stages are not only short and sweet, but have plenty of variety to keep them fresh, and the story provides clear motivation for why the characters need to clear each one giving plenty of incentive for the player to find out what happens next. So in my humble opinion, the third Farland story, Tenshi no Namida, is by far the best in the series yet. Still, when looking at the series as a whole, it's hard not to see it as a bit of a transitional game. While it isn't one of the first two classic Farland games that appeared in all the console remakes, it still features the same protagonist. It's like TGL was still stuck thinking that a sequel needs to feature the same characters as the previous games. In the next one, we'll not only get a completely new and complex story, but also a whole new cast of characters. I can't wait to play it, and hopefully make another video about it too. Thanks for watching this episode of PC98 Paradise. I want to give a special thanks to all my patrons on Patreon, as well as those supporting the channel through the YouTube memberships we started recently. As always, thanks to everybody for watching, and it'll be great to see you all back again for the next video.